Now our next speaker is a financial media celebrity recognized all over the world. He's a multiple New York Times best-selling author. Please welcome Mr. Jim Rickards. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. I love um, Vancouver. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. Uh, I've been here a number of times, although this is the first time I've been here that, other than the end of July, and all of the, the local uh, Vancouverites know that that's the best weather of the year right around the end of July. So I feel like I'm getting a, a real Vancouver experience with the rain and the overcast, but uh, be that as it may, it's, it's a beautiful city and, and great to be here. I should add that I've done the grouse grind uh, two or three times, I forget, but multiple times, so I think that gives me a little uh, honorary uh, Vancouver uh, citizen status. Um, I've got about um, two hours of material. We're going to do it in 30 minutes. Don't worry, I'm not going to be here for two hours, but um, we'll go at a pretty rapid tempo. But I think a lot of the uh, subjects we're going to cover are familiar, but we're going to drill down on some particular technical aspects I think have a lot of uh, meaning for, uh, for uh, what's going to happen to the future of money. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not a driller, I'm not a miner, I'm not an oil and gas person, I'm a monetary economist. But you need money to develop natural resources, and most of the natural resources are sold for money. And all of you have portfolios of uh, investments, and um, obviously it's a topic. I like to say when it comes to, when it comes to your own money, uh, everybody has a PhD. Uh, it's amazing how people who don't really spend a lot of time on the economic side are very, very sharp, very, very focused with their own portfolio. So uh, I respect that, and hopefully we'll have, we'll have some uh, content that will be useful to you. So my subject, uh, the future of money, now, I've thrown in uh, th three kinds of money. Gold, you all know, uh, crypto, uh, it's the new kid on the block, although you've heard a lot about it, probably heard nothing else uh, for the past uh, several months at least, and then fiat, or so-called paper money, central bank money. Uh, and these are the three contenders, think of it as a foot race, we got, or maybe a horse race, we've got three horses in the paddock and we're gonna run around the track and see who wins. So let's just take these one at a time. Um, before we do that though, let's, I just wanna kind of step back and say, what is money? Because everyone thinks they know what money is. I've got some money in my wallet, I've got some money in the bank. Uh, I would argue that your money in the bank is not your money, it's the bank's money and they'll give it to you if they feel like it. But um, it's, a, it's a big question and the answer is all the things in this uh, slide, whether it's uh, feathers, shells, uh, obviously gold, the euro, uh, Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies, silver, beads, digital money, these are all forms of money, every one of them. And one of the criticisms of certain forms of money is that it has no, um, that there's nothing behind it. You know, people go, well, there's nothing behind the Canadian dollar, or there's nothing behind the US dollar, or one of the criticisms is Bitcoin. Why would I have Bitcoin? There's nothing behind it, et cetera. And I would submit that every one of these forms of money and others that are not here do have something behind them. In fact, they all have the same thing behind them. It's the only thing that matters, which is confidence. In other words, anything can be money. Many things have been money. Uh, the question is, uh, do we have confidence that it's money? If I have it and I want to exchange it for goods and services and I'm going to give it to you and you're going to provide some goods and services, are you confident that you can give it to someone else, that they'll accept it in exchange for goods and services you need? Or if you're holding on to it, are you confident that it will be money in the future to preserve your wealth? So the entire field of monetary economics, which would fill up a college or graduate or PhD curriculum, comes down to one thing, it's a confidence game. If, if we all think it's money, it's money. And if we don't, it isn't. And the problem with confidence, it's a very powerful thing, but it's psychological. It can be lost very easily. And once it's lost, it's impossible to regain. And so when you're thinking about money or how you want to allocate your portfolio or your preferred form of money, ask yourself this question. Regardless of how it is viewed today, how comfortable am I that in the future, people will still have confidence in this as money. That's the most important question you can ask. Um, so let's go into gold a little bit. Now, people will tell you, and this came up in the, the panel yesterday, Danielle uh, Cambone asked some good questions about this. Uh, people say, well, gold, I say people, uh, maybe not the folks in this audience, and certainly not myself, but um, economists, uh, central bankers, et cetera, they'll tell you, well, gold can't be money. You cannot have a monetary system based on gold. We used to, everyone recognizes that. But there's a whole long list of reasons why gold cannot be money. And, uh, and they'll throw these at you, and every time the subject comes up, you're at a cocktail party or whatever, and if you say, I like gold, or I have gold, or some of my wealth is in gold, uh, they'll say, well, don't you know the following? Uh, the first argument you hear is, um, 
there's not enough gold to support finance and commerce. It's like maybe there was once upon a time, but the, the it, commerce has grown so much, the dollar value of transactions have grown so much, gold hasn't kept up. There's not enough gold in the world to support the world economy, so not enough gold. Second thing is even if you had a gold standard, the gold supply doesn't grow fast enough. The new gold coming out of the ground comes out at a slower percentage tempo than world growth, and so you have a natural deflationary bias, and that's not suitable because we don't like deflation. Uh, gold has no yield. That's Warren Buffett's favorite. Warren Buffett, uh, everyone thinks he's a great stock picker. He's actually a genius at tax deferred compounding. And if you do that math, you'll understand why he's uh, worth probably $70 billion. But uh, Buffett doesn't like anything with no yield. Um, Paul Krugman's favorite, gold caused the Great Depression. Gold caused financial panics. We can't have that. We have to have an age without depressions and panics. So we can't have gold. Uh, and then the old favorite, gold has no intrinsic value. It's a uh, my friend Joe Weisenthal in Bloomberg says, you know, it's a shiny, um, shiny rock. And I, I go, Joe, it's a metal, not a rock. But, uh, but he says it has no intrinsic value. And then the other one, John Maynard Keynes called it a barbarous relic. That's usually the first one you hear. Gold is a barbarous relic. Okay. Every one of these things is untrue. Every one of them. Except the yield thing, which I'll come to. But they're all untrue. Let me show you why. So first of all, it's not enough gold to support finance and commerce. Well, what's the money supply in the world? If you take M1 for the US, China, the Eurozone, and Japan, so that's basically 75% of the global economy. So these are really the currencies and the economies that count. It's $24 trillion. Now, if you, and how much gold is there? Now, I'm talking about official gold owned by central banks and finance ministries. The answer is 33,000 metric tons. How much gold do you need to back the currency? How much gold do you need in a gold standard? Well, that's a subjective judgment, but um, my, I'm using 40%. The Austrian economists will say, no, it's got to be 100%. You know, you can't have any leverage. Eh, maybe. The, historically, very successful gold standards have been run with 20%. Uh, the Bank of England in the, 18, uh, in the 19th century, uh, the, actually the Federal Reserve uh, in the United States in most of the 20th century had 20% uh, backing. So 40% is actually uh, quite high historically. So if you take the 24 trillion of money supply and you want to back it with 40% gold, you need $9.6 trillion worth of gold to support that money supply. So I said there's 33,000 tons. I'm using a price of 1,300 an ounce. It fluctuates, obviously, but that's a good estimate. Comes out to 1.5 trillion. Aha, not enough, right? You need 9.6 trillion. You only have 1.5 trillion. OK, but what if you change the price? In other words, if you raise the price to $8,265 an ounce, now the same 33,000 tons comes to 9.6 trillion, which is just right to support commerce. In other words, there's always enough gold. When someone says there's not enough gold, just look at them and say there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. You have to get the price right. Uh, and this is, um, when I talk about $10,000 gold, uh, that's my intermediate price target. Um, it's not a number I made up. I don't pull it out of the air. I'm not trying to attract attention. It's actually the implied non-deflationary price. This month, these are up-to-date figures, but this money supply keeps growing. That $24 trillion keeps growing. <coughs> Pardon me, so my estimate is by the time you get around to a gold standard, which, which may happen, it'll be $10,000 now. So short answer is there's always enough gold, just a question of price. And you can expect in a gold standard, the price will be $10,000 an ounce. Gold supply doesn't grow fast enough. Well, annual mining output increases the existing stock of gold about 1.6% a year. World GDP grows about 2.9% a year. Aha, is it true? The gold supply doesn't grow fast enough to keep up with the economic growth. The answer is no. Again, this is nonsense. And the reason is that in addition to the 33,000 official tons, which I just talked about, there's about 150,000 tons of private gold. And if a central bank needs more gold to support the money supply, all they have to do is print money and buy it. In other words, you could, uh, you could set your gold uh, hoard at any level you want just by printing money. And by the way, this is exactly how the Fed increases money supply. What they do is they print money and buy bonds. It's called an open market operation. Well, there's no reason you can't print money and buy gold to get gold. And then with a 40% ratio for every dollar's worth of gold, you could have two and a half dollars of money supply. So you can't, have you can't have discretionary monetary policy and a gold standard at the same time. In fact, the United States did have this from 1913 to 1971. Uh, sorry, 1968. That's when the 40% um, the, the 20 percent ratio was repealed. So the point being, um, the limit on mining output is irrelevant. It's irrelevant because you can always buy private gold with public money and increase your gold supply and support any level of economic activity you want. So this one doesn't hold up. 
Gold has no yield. Well, this one's true, but it's not supposed to have a yield. Gold is money. So gold has no yield, but a $100 bill has no yield. Reach in your wallet, pull out a dollar bill, Canadian, US, whatever, and look at it. Does it have a yield? No. It's a perpetual non-interest bearing liability of a central bank. So it's money though, it is a form of money. It doesn't have a yield, money doesn't have a yield. People go, oh, well, I, get, I get a yield on my money, I put it in the bank. When you put it in the bank, it's not money anymore. It's a deposit, it's an unsecured liability of a occasionally insolvent bank. People go, I have money in the stock market. No, you don't, you have stocks. I have money in real estate. No, you don't, you have real estate. I have money in bonds. No, you don't, you have bonds. In other words, if you wanna convert real estate bonds or stocks into money, you gotta sell it, and guess what? When you go to do that, probably everyone else in the world is doing it at the same time, and your money's disappearing, so-called money, before your eyes. So real money is a, is a, doesn't have a yield, it's not supposed to, it's a, uh, it's a unit of account, it's a store of value. If you want yield, you have to turn it into something else that has risk. You don't get yield without risk. Money's not supposed to have risk. Gold has no risk, it's just gold. You put it in a drawer, go back 10 years later, it's still there, hasn't changed. Same thing with a $100 bill. It's not supposed to have yield. Uh, here's Paul Krugman's favorite, as I mentioned, gold caused depressions and panics. Well, during the gold standard, uh, particularly, uh, well, uh, through basically all of, <laughs> all of human history uh, prior to recently, there were lots of financial panics just in the history of the United States. I listed some here, 1797 and so forth. <coughs> Pardon me, 1907 was a big one, 1929. Um, we're all panics, but the point is when we went off the gold standard, we also, <clears throat> pardon me, we also had financial panics. And I listed them there in 1973, the oil crisis, 1980, Latin American debt crisis, 87, the stock market fell 22% in one day. If that happened today, by the way, 22% would be the equivalent of 5,000 points on the Dow Jones. You know, if it went down 500 points, that's all you'd be hearing about. Imagine going down 5,000 points. That's what happened on October 19, 1987. And 94 was the Mexican tequila crisis, 98, the Russia long-term capital crisis, 2000, the dot-com bubble, 2008, you all know what happened then. The point is, the gold standard has nothing to do with panics and depressions. They happen with a gold standard, sure, but they also happen without a gold standard. Financial panics are psychological phenomena. Uh, they have nothing to do with gold. Uh, and so this, again, this is just another one of these false uh, red herring arguments people throw out there. So panics happen with or without a gold standard. The gold standard is irrelevant to the issue of whether you're ever gonna have a financial panic. It has to do with leverage and psychology. Um, gold has no intrinsic value. Actually, it does have an intrinsic value, but intrinsic value is irrelevant. Uh, David Ricardo was the uh, the, the economist who came up with the theory of intrinsic value, and what he said was, well, intrinsic value is what it costs, all the inputs, so how much labor, how much capital, how much time and effort, those are the inputs, that's what something is worth. And Karl Marx took the same argument, but he said yes, but you have capital and labor, and the capitalists control the means of production, they take more than their share, that was the surplus labor theory of value, and, and labor is disadvantaged because they don't get their share, and that's gonna lead to a revolution, et cetera, et cetera. The intrinsic, that, the, the intrinsic value theory is true but irrelevant because it's not how we value things. And Carl Menger, uh, founder of the Austrian School of Economics, University of Vienna in 1871, said no, we value things that are subjective. Something is, you've all heard the expression, something's worth what someone's willing to pay for you. Go to a miner, his mining costs are $1,400 an ounce in a very expensive mine, and gold's $1,300 an ounce. He says, I'm losing money. Too bad. I mean, no, nobody says, you know, his intrinsic cost is 1400 but nobody says, well, that should be the price of gold because that's your intrinsic cost. It's irrelevant. It costs about $4,000 per Bitcoin to mine a Bitcoin. And I say mine, that's their word. You know, it's a, it's a, um, a, a electronic uh, problem solving function. And if you can sell it for $10,000, uh, good for you. But uh, the fact is, these things do have intrinsic value, but intrinsic value is not what things are worth. They're worth what someone will pay for it, that's subjective value. So the fact that it does, it, it, people say it has no intrinsic value, it actually does, but it's irrelevant and that's the point. Um, finally, Keynes called gold a barbarous relic, not true, he never said it. Uh, I actually had, went to an antiquarian bookseller and got a copy of the 1924 book, Monetary Reform, I got a first edition, I wanted to look it up myself because this quote was very hard to track down. What he said was, quote, in truth the gold standard is already a barbarous relic. In other words, he was talking about the international monetary system of the 1920s. The 
the so-called gold exchange standard. He didn't say gold was a barbarous relic. He said the gold standard that we have, and he was right. It was a very messed up gold standard because it wasn't limited to gold. Uh, Keynes was an advocate for a gold standard in 1914 when he was fairly young. He was an advocate again in 1944 at Bretton Woods. So Keynes is not quite the gold basher that people make him out to be. So uh, the point is every one of these arguments is either not true or if it is true, it's okay because um, it, it, it's, it's obvious that gold has no yield, yeah, but it's not supposed to. So in other words, all of the objections to gold as money fall down, every single one of them. There is no impediment to having a monetary standard based on gold. And if you do, I'm not saying it's gonna to happen tomorrow, I'm saying that in a financial panic, in a liquidity crisis, in a monetary panic, worse than 2008, which I do expect, if international elites, the IMF, finance ministers of the G20 countries have to restore confidence and they turn to gold, which they might, you have to have $10,000 gold. Any lower price is deflationary. It would completely defeat the purpose. It would repeat the blunders of 1925. And so um, basically there's nothing standing in the way of a, of a gold standard tomorrow. So let's talk about crypto, everyone's favorite topic. My, my least favorite topic, I believe me, I spend a lot of time on it, I study it, I read all these white papers, I read peer-reviewed scientific papers, I grind my way through the equations, uh, but it's, uh, it's painful. But, uh, let's, but everyone wants to talk about it, so let's jump in. First of all, there's no such thing as cryptocurrency. There are a thousand cryptocurrencies. In other words, you cannot speak generically about cryptocurrencies. Jim Rickards hates cryptocurrencies. That's not true. I really, really dislike Bitcoin, and I'll tell you why. But there are cryptocurrencies out there that I think are very interesting and, and worth uh, your consideration. Um, I'm for it. I'm against it. Cryptocurrency is, means nothing. You have to talk about the specific currency. And I'm, uh, and I'm here I'm showing uh, Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, Monero, and Ether. By the way, isn't it fascinating how the graphical representation of cryptocurrencies is always a gold or silver coin? Um, you know, Bitcoin's gold and Litecoin's silver, Monero's both, and Ether is, is gold. I mean, what are they trying to say? I think that psychologically what they're saying is, well, this is, this is nothing, but if we pretend, if we pretend it's a gold coin, then someone will buy it. Uh, but I, I just find this a little bit of an aside. But no, it's the same thing is true with fiat currencies. You can't be... Uh, like or dislike fiat currencies generically. Some people do because they just hate central banks. I understand that. But it's a big difference between a, uh, a, a Venezuelan Bolivar and, a, Bolivar and a, a euro. Big difference between a Zimbabwe dollar and a U.S. dollar. So in other words, don't talk to me about cryptocurrencies. Tell me what specific one you want to talk about. And that's a more interesting conversation. I think it's really important because this, this field is so muddied. The conversation is so muddied. People not distinguishing between blockchain and currency, not, not distinguishing between different types of currencies, et cetera. I think we need to step back, take a deep breath, and be rigorous in our analysis and think about what we're actually talking about. There's no such thing as a blockchain. There are hundreds of blockchains. In other words, every currency, every token, every um, so-called smart contract, if you're using Ether, has a different blockchain. So there are at least hundreds, perhaps thousands of blockchains, new ones being created every day. So again, don't talk to me about blockchain. Tell me which specific blockchain you're talking about because they're not all the same, and this is critical. The main difference, there are, there are many differences in this blockchain technology, but the main difference is validation. Because remember, the whole idea, the whole idea uh, of cryptocurrencies and blockchain and the original Bitcoin and what Satoshi Nakamoto came up with is that we're, not, we're going to have a trustless system. We're not going to trust banks. We're not going to trust clearinghouses. We're not going to trust exchanges. We're not going to trust central banks. We're not going to trust anybody. We're going to have a decentralized system that a community can validate, and we don't have to rely on anybody in particular. That was the original idea. So the question is, what's your method of validation? And that's what distinguishes one blockchain from the other. So there's, there, I've listed four of them here, but there are others. Proof of work, that's what blockchain uses. And you know what the work is? You gotta like factor these, you know, 87-digit uh, 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 um, prime numbers uh, into, or numbers into prime factors. Uh, it's a lot of computer crunching, completely clunky, completely inefficient, non-sustainable. I'll talk about that in a second. But that's Bitcoin. There's something else called proof of stake, meaning you actually, this is what Ether is based on, you demonstrate that you have a certain percentage of the processing power, so you step up based on your stake. There's proof of space. 
uh, space is storage space on a hard drive, so I get to vote on the blockchain. I get to vote on validating the blockchain because I've decided to devote a certain amount of my hard drive to that process. That's, there's a new coin called Spacement. Uh, and then there's the Byzantine Agreement, or Byzantine Agreement. Um, there's something, there's a version of that called the Federated Byzantine Agreement, uh, which uh, I uh, personally uh, think is the best, um, much more, uh, uh, much more robust to some of the problems we're talking about, and there are others. But the point is, don't talk about blockchain. Say, okay, what's your what's your governance model? What's your validation model, uh, etc. And then and then ask yourself, is that sustainable? Is that robust? Will that resist an attack? Are your, are your cryptocurrencies going to be stolen? These are the questions you have to ask yourself, and there are no generic answers, so I, I cannot emphasize enough. Coin by coin, I hate to use the word coin, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> token by token, uh, blockchain by blockchain, be rigorous and ask yourself what's sustainable. Now, um, Bitcoin, Ripple, and Ether, and some of these other cryptocurrencies, not all of them, not all of them, but the, but the best known are going to fail. When I say fail, they're going to, you know, Bitcoin might have a, um, a $200 value as a uh, token for criminals, and criminals and terrorists might, might find a, uh, a use case at about $200 per Bitcoin, but they're basically not going to be anywhere ne near where they are today. Why do I say that? I don't want to make a claim without backing it up. The first point is they're non-scalable. Transaction times are slow. Uh, and then when you say that to Bitcoin people, they go, aha, the Lightning Network is right around the corner. You know, Lightning's going to, we'll see. You know, they said that about Segregated Witness. They said that about some of these other solutions. They, they don't seem to get community support. They keep forking the Bitcoin, meaning one day you wake up and there's two blockchains instead of one. Or whatever happened to that whole idea that we weren't going to have inflation, that we weren't going to pull new cryptos out of thin air. But uh, these solutions, you have to understand what the solution is. So what they're saying is, Nobody has a solution for the inherent slowness, clunkiness, non-scalability of the original Bitcoin blockchain. There's no solution for that. So when you hear about solutions, what are they? Well, what they're saying is take a bunch of transactions offline. So everybody in the room could form a group, or let's say every, every coffee shop in Brooklyn, New York, or every coffee shop in Vancouver could form a group. And all the people who want to buy coffee would join that group. And we would agree, so we're in our own little bubble over here, and we would agree that all of our Bitcoin transactions uh, among each other are, don't go on the blockchain. They just get settled in this sort of separate cloud over here, and then we net them out. So, you know, I pay you five Bitcoin, and you pay the person next to you four, and he pays the lady in the back of the room 10, and she pays me seven, and we, add all, we net it out, and then periodically, and it could be daily, weekly, monthly, or whatever, we net all this stuff out, and then we take that net and we put that on the blockchain. So that the amount of transactions that have to go on the blockchain is greatly reduced, that's true. But what, if, what are we doing? We've created our own network. I gotta trust the coffee shops. How do I know they're not gonna steal my money? In other words, it's only a solution because you're completely negating the original idea. Well, I'll be sure, if you want to, if you want to tear, up the, tear up the original idea and start over, that's fine, but don't tell me you're adhering to the idea of a decentralized trustless network because you're not. All you've done is create another network. Somebody, uh, you know, I get trolled on Twitter all the time. People tell me I'm an idiot and I don't know technology and all that stuff. And then my more sour moods, I tell them I was coding uh, before they were born. But uh, as, far as, uh, as far as some of these, um, these things are concerned, uh, somebody said, well, you don't understand payment channels. And uh, I actually do. And I said, yeah, I understand payment channels. Uh, we, we had those in the 50s. They were called party lines, we, which is, you know, you pick up the phone and someone's talking. You've got to ask them to get off the phone so you can go. In other words, there was an AT&T network, at least in the United States, but other people could jump in on this little side thing. You know, that's all it is. These are party lines. So uh, that, that doesn't work. Non-sustainable. The energy usage to do, to solve the problem and make the proof of work in Bitcoin is now greater than the annual energy output of Ireland. Imagine taking all the electricity used in Ireland in a year, and that's how much we have to use to, to crunch numbers. By the way, every applied mathematician will tell you that prime factoring is a trivial problem. It it's like an uninteresting, not a, uninteresting problem. But it takes a lot of computing power to do it because the numbers are so big and the possibilities are so great. So we're just wasting the entire electrical usage of Ireland. In a few years, it's going to be the entire electrical usage of Japan. Who thinks, who in this room thinks that governments are going to allow Bitcoin miners 
to use as much electricity in a year as the entire country of Japan, the third largest economy in the world. That's not going to happen. It's, you know it's not going to happen. Uh, it's not very green. It's not very, it's completely wasteful. In other words, it, it, can't, it can't happen. So that's why I say it's not sustainable. It's going to hit a wall. Non-regulated, you know, I don't have to remind you of all the frauds, new ones popping up every day. Um, and it's not just exchanges. Uh, exchanges are, how do exchanges work? Well, you know, you, I want to go to a Bitcoin exchange. Well, you got to go and you got to open an account, just like Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab, right? So, uh, you know, or, or, T, or Toronto Dominion. So you go, you give me your name, your address, your social security number, your bank wire information, give them all that information, and then send them dollars. And they say, okay, you got some Bitcoin, here's your confirmation. Really? How do I know you didn't just take my dollars and send me a phony baloney? confirmation. How do I know you're not, um, you know, a, a Ponzi? You're using new money to pay off the old money. How do I know you're not Bernie Madoff in, uh, you know, with a, with a computer engineering degree? Uh, how do I know you're not a bucket shop? How do I know any of those things? The answer is you don't. Uh, so good luck with that. Uh, not to mention Bitcoin whales. They, they estimate there are a thousand people who control 40% of the Bitcoin. Now you got millennials buying, you know, one one hundredth of a bitcoin for, you know, ten bucks or whatever the math is, hundred bucks. Uh, but you got these, I call them the whales, these thousand people who have forty percent of all the bitcoin. You don't think they have a big vested interest in keeping the price up, and you don't think they wash trade, do wash sales. So A sells to B for ten thousand, B sells back for eleven thousand, A sells back for twelve thousand, B sells back for thirteen thousand. This is called painting the tape. It's the oldest trick in the book. Um, and there's no profit loss because we're selling the same Bitcoin back and forth. But what we are doing is creating a ticker that gets the millennials, I shouldn't pick up millennials, three millennial children, but gets uh, people all over the world, maybe a, a garage mechanic in South Korea took out a home equity loan or hocked his inventory, put his entire life savings into Bitcoin and has now been wiped out and is desperate and suicidal. That's what's going on. It's basically rich people stealing from the poor. Uh, not a good business model in my view. And then finally, uh, there's no use case other than the criminals, terrorists, or tax evaders. Why is Bitcoin better than Visa unless you're a criminal? Now, if you're a criminal, I get it. If you're buying child pornography, uh, you want to use the dark web and use some cryptos and all that. And if you try doing that with Visa, you'll probably get a call from the FBI. So I understand why it's good for criminals. But if you're not a criminal, if you're not a tax evader, if you're not buying child pornography, if you're not an arms dealer, if you're not a terrorist, then why is Bitcoin better than Visa? Anybody? Yes. Well, um, yeah, Visa is very convenient, if you ask me, but the point is um, there's really no use case for it other than crime. Um, and then it's non-elastic. And this is uh, important because there's a finite number of Bitcoins, 21 million Bitcoin. They're getting closer to that level every day. When, and everyone's like, this is a good thing because, you know, the problem with central banks is they print all this money and we're going to have inflation. By the way, we haven't had any inflation for the last eight years. Separate issue. I'll come to that if we don't run out of time. But... Um, uh, you know, we hate central banks, they print too much money, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're going to cap the number of Bitcoin. But, but, but money supply has to be elastic. It can't be too elastic. The problem with central bank money is that it's too elastic, too elastic. The reason, by the way, gold is such a good form of money is that it grows slowly. It grows at about the tempo of world growth. It grows at about the tempo of population growth. Not exactly, but close enough that it's the best form of money anyone's ever discovered. But <coughs> Pardon me. Um, but the problem with Bitcoin, when you hit a hard stop, which they will, and the economy keeps growing, but you want to back it with Bitcoin, so here's your money supply and here's your economy, that's inherently deflationary, right? Because each Bitcoin's got to support more and more growth, meaning your Bitcoin is worth more in theory. But the problem is you never get there. Why? Because if you have a deflationary currency, there's no bond market. The money supply grows based on credit, based on loans based on various forms of borrowing. The money supply is just a foundation and, the, and the, the, the economy grows with credit. Nobody wants to borrow in a form of money that's going to be more expensive when you pay it back. I'm not talking about interest. That's always part of the equation. I'm saying the money itself is, um, is worth more when you have to pay back the loan. No one's going to borrow in that loan. Therefore, no bond market. Therefore, no viable form of money. So these are all the reasons why this is going to hit the wall. Uh, how do you find I said there were some good cryptos out there. How do you distinguish uh, between the two? Um, I've come up with a, I worked, uh, researched this for a long time. and came up with a five factor function. Uh, I call it COIN. That's just, you know, you come up with these acronyms so people can uh, 
uh, kind of relate to it, uh, but it, it stands for the following. C is for consensus. This goes back to the validation method I talked about earlier, meaning um, the best validation method, these uh, Byzantine agreements that I described, uh, what you do is you let white hats, you let good guys into the validation world, even if they don't have um, a stake or that much processing power, but they get to kind of vote, and that, and everybody looks at everybody else. The way this works, it's kind of like, how do you get a, a search result on Google? I mean, what was, what was uh, Larry Page and, uh, and, and uh, Sergey Brin's insight that led to Google, you know, maybe the most valuable company in the world almost? Well, it was let people decide. In other words, our search engine is going to show the result that the most people who have ever asked the same question decided it was a good result for them. That's all it is. So maybe start out it's a little bit inefficient, but after a, a million searches or 10 million searches, if the overwhelming majority of people said, this is, this is the answer, I had a question, here's the answer, and you go to Google, that's the, that's the link you're going to get. All they do is let the community, through their own actions, through their own validation, decide what's the, um, what's the best answer. Well, there are ways of doing that to validate the blockchain, including people who, don't, who are not miners. Uh, open source uh, just means that you know, the code's available and anyone can participate. This would distinguish it from what's called a permissioned system, like FedCoin, if the Federal Reserve had a crypto or, the, or IMF or others. Um, impenetrable just means it's robust to attack. If 51% of the miners, if 51% of the Bitcoin miners came up with a block that said they owned all the Bitcoin and they took all your Bitcoin and they validated it, they would have the Bitcoin. It's irreversible, you have no recourse. And now the theory, Nakamoto's theory was that, well, that'll never happen because that's an awful lot of processing power. But again, he wasn't really thinking like a geopolitical strategist. What if you're Russia and you said, I'm gonna spend $50 billion to create 51% of the mining capacity in the world and I'm gonna steal all the Bitcoin in the world and take down the Western financial system. In other words, that's a kind of financial warfare, but warfare is not free, that's the point. Warfare is not free. And so um, spending $50 billion to get the processing power to destroy Bitcoin might be a smart move relative to building 10 aircraft carriers, which would also co cost you $50 billion. Uh, in other words, it's not, uh, and, and so much of the mining power is concentrated in China right now. Chinese government, these are communists. It's a communist dictatorship. There's no recourse. They could take over those miners tomorrow. So the idea that you can't aggregate 51% of the mining power is just not true, and there are other kinds of attacks. So you want a, a coin that's not vulnerable to those, what they call the 51% miner attack. No nonsense governance, that's what I was talking about earlier. You don't want this clunky proof of work, and nimble, fast, easy use. If you're not faster than Visa, if you're not faster than PayPal, if, you know, if, it, if it costs you $60 to do a $50 Bitcoin transaction, so you're gonna pay them 10 to make your money go away, that's how it works today. Well, that's not competing with anything, and that has no future. So fiat, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, the Fed has a conundrum, which is they want inflation in a deflationary world. They don't want a lot of inflation. They say they want 2%. They probably want 3%. But the point is uh, they can't get there. There are powerful deflationary forces, demographics, debt, deleveraging technology. Uh, but the Fed cannot permit deflation. It destroys tax collections, for one thing. You're, with the same nominal income, you don't get a raise. Same nominal income, your standard of living goes up if you have deflation because your money is worth more. Well, that's true, but they don't know how to tax that. If your boss gives you a raise, they know exactly how to tax that. But governments haven't figured out how to tax the increased purchase, purchasing power in a deflationary world. So therefore, central banks can't allow it. So they've got to get inflation. They've got zero interest rate policy, negative interest rate policy, QE, operation twist. They list all the ways they can kind of get inflation. The problem is, I call this uh, Mick Jagger, Jaggernomics. Mick Jagger saying you can't always get what you want. Um, and it's true, just because central banks want inflation doesn't mean they can get it. Now this is a bit technical, but just take that equation over on the right-hand side of the screen, MV equals PQ. M is the money supply, V is the velocity or the turnover. PQ together is nominal GDP broken into Q, which is real GDP, and P, which is a price index. That's all, it's, it's a truism. You don't, you don't have to know really much more than that. So if velocity is constant and money supply goes up, the nominal GDP will go up. But if there's a structural limit of about 3% real growth and everything over 3% has to be inflation. And that's how you get inflation. Well, down below, you see how the money supply went up from 800 billion to 4.2 trillion. 
Uh, but where's the inflation? We never got any inflation. Well, why not? If velocity is constant and money supply goes up, why isn't nominal GDP going up way, way faster than uh, the structural boundary of 3% create a lot of inflation? Well, the answer is velocity is not constant. Milton Friedman was wrong, and you see what's happening to velocity there. Velocity is crashing. So this is the, this is the problem the Fed has. Um, but the Fed could have 150% inflation in 15 minutes. All they have to do is go into a room, close the door, take a vote, and decide that gold is $3,000 an ounce because they say so, and then come out and use your system open market account to maintain the price of gold. So what you do is you say, hey, uh, you think gold's, uh, you think gold's uh, highly priced? We'll take it. Uh, we're buyer 29.25, uh, and uh, you think gold's cheap? Come and get it. We'll sell it to you at 30.75. If you're a buyer at 25 um, and a seller at 30.75, guess what the price is? It's about $3,000 an ounce. In other words, you can use the gold at Fort Knox and use the printing press to maintain a two-way market in gold, um, and, and then, then you get your inflation. That $3,000 gold is a, almost 70% devaluation of the dollar. That's the right way to think about it. Nothing happens in a vacuum. This is when you get $100 oil, $50 silver, $6 copper, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the Fed can get inflation, but they might have to do it the same way they did it in 1933, which is to revalue gold. And I make the point that gold always wins. In the greatest deflation in American history, 1927 to 1933, gold went up uh, 70%. At the beginning of the Depression, gold was $20.67 an ounce. At the end of the Depression, it was $35 an ounce. Gold went up 70% 70, 70 in a world of 30% deflation. But when you have inflation, gold also wins. In uh, between 1976 and 1981, the U.S. had 55% inflation, and gold went up 300% from $150 an ounce to $600 an ounce. So in other words, gold always wins. It, it, what it really does, it maintains its purchasing power through deflation and inflation one way or the other. Uh, I don't, I'm going to wrap up quickly, uh, just make the point there's this geopolitical aspect to this. China, Russia, Iran, and Turkey are buying gold hand over fist. Um, they're getting ready for the day when the dollar is no longer the global reserve currency. They see it coming. Most Americans do not. Um, our friend Kim Jong-un, getting ready. we're going to be in war with uh, North Korea before the end of the year. Um, don't take it from me. I've sat with uh, Mike Pompeo, director of the CIA, uh, General McMaster, the national security advisor. Uh, we've heard the same thing from General Mattis, Rex Tillerson, President Trump, and most recently, Chief of Staff John Kelly. They have all said the same thing. North Korea cannot have these weapons, period. There's no debate. General McMaster said acceptance is unacceptable. And yet North Korea is going for these weapons, so therefore we're heading for a war. I think you all know what that'll do to the price of gold. Uh, look for the IMF to maybe have a crypto SDR um, on a permissioned uh, hyperledger. Um, and again, the BRICS are about on, on the brink of getting veto power in the IMF, so the IMF will not be able to bail out the world unless they say so and their price might be the end of the dollar as the global reserve currency. Here's my um, personal portfolio. If you, if you want, I don't own any cryptos. I don't have them and I don't recommend them. Um, but uh, if, you, uh, if you wanted some, I got 20% private equity in alts. You know, put a little sliver in there, but don't, don't get Bitcoin or Ether or the ones I mentioned. There are some good the cryptos out there that I, I recommend. I don't, again, I don't own them personally, but if you said to me, are there any cryptos worth considering, I would say, yeah, there are some. Um, and, oops, go back. And uh, if you're interested in this, and I'm sorry we're, we're out of time, but uh, I wrote a couple books that cover uh, all these topics, and uh, certainly uh, appreciate the audience, and thank you very much.